in the early hours of the morning of Tuesday the 18th of September 1888, Elizabeth Burns, a one-armed unfortunate who was lodging at 55 Flower and Dean Street in Spitalfields, was soliciting on Whitechapel Road when she was approached by a decently dressed man who walked with a limp. After a brief conversation in which he spoke in English but with an evident accent, she agreed to go with him. The two set off along Whitechapel High Street, continuing on to Allgate High Street where they passed a line of shops known as Butcher's Row, after which they turned left into Minories. There, the man led Liz into a dark, unlit passage named Three Kings Court, which was demolished long ago. However, Golden Fleece Court at the Allgate High Street end of Minories has survived, and it gives us an idea of what the notorious Three Kings Court must have looked like. Here, as Liz stood against the wall and faced him, the man proceeded to put his arm around her neck. Looking down, she was horrified to see that he was holding an open knife in his hand. At that moment, Police Constable John Johnson of the City of London Police was passing along Minories on his beat when he heard screams of murder emanating from Three Kings Court. Knowing its reputation as a dangerous locality, the officer hurried to investigate and, according to his later testimony, he found a terrified woman and a man who was evidently intoxicated standing together in the darkness. Johnson demanded to know what was happening, to which the man replied, Nothing. Oh, policeman, do take me out of this, the woman stammered. Johnson later stated that the woman was so frightened that she wasn't able to say anything else, so he sent the man on his way and then he walked with the woman to the end of his beat. At this point she recovered the power of speech and suddenly blurted out, Dear me, he frightened me very much when he pulled a big knife out. Constable Johnson's jaw must have hit the ground at the prospect that he may well have let the Whitechapel murderer slip through his fingers. Why didn't you tell me that at the time? he asked the woman. I was too much frightened, was her timid response. Johnson hurried back along Minories in the hope that he might spot the man again, but there was no sign of him. Turning back, he discovered that the woman had also now disappeared. He therefore opted to continue on his beat and asked several other constables that he encountered to be on the lookout for the man. Shortly after Johnson had sent the man on his way, Alexander Feinberg, who was also referred to as Alexander Finley by some newspapers, of 51 Lehman Street, was standing at a coffee stall at the junction of Whitechapel High Street and Commercial Road, when a man who was evidently drunk approached the stall and asked for a cup of coffee. The stallholder refused to serve him, whereupon the man turned to Feinberg and, speaking in broken English, demanded to know what he was looking at. Feinberg replied that he was doing no harm, but the stranger snapped, Oh, you want something? and proceeded to pull out a long-bladed pocket knife. Having threatened to stab Feinberg with it, the man then chased him around the stall, whilst making several thrusts at him with the blade. He only stopped when Feinberg grabbed a dish and threatened to smash it over his head. At this point, Police Constable Gallagher, who had been notified by Johnson to keep an eye out for the suspicious character, arrived at the stall and took the man into custody. The officer later recalled that the prisoner had been very excited and on the way to the police station he had dropped a long-bladed pocket knife which was open. When he had searched him at the station, he had also found a razor and a long-bladed pair of scissors. The man turned out to be a 40-year-old German barber by the name of Charles Ludwig, who had been living in London for the past 15 or so months. Later that morning, Ludwig appeared at the Thames Police Court, where he claimed not to speak or understand English. The police requested that he be remanded in custody in order to give them time to make inquiries concerning him. Stating that he believed him to be a very dangerous man, the magistrate, Mr Saunders, duly remanded him for a week. With Ludwig safely under lock and key, the newspapers began looking into his background and several of them seriously entertained the possibility that he might well be the Whitechapel murderer. As one newspaper put it, 
great excitement prevails as it is believed that some important discoveries in connection with the recent murders may come to light and that the prisoner knows something about the tragedies. It transpired that he also went under the name of Wetzel, which according to some newspaper accounts was in fact his actual name, and that for the past two weeks he had been employed as a hairdresser at the shop of Mr. C. A. Partridge on Minories. His employer told a journalist that Ludwig was a good workman who was rather fond of drink. Significantly, Mr. Partridge scoffed at the idea that Ludwig might be the Whitechapel murderer on the grounds that he was too much of a coward. Further inquiries revealed that on the Sunday night prior to the attack, Ludwig had lodged in the house of a German tailor named Johannes in Church Street, Minories. The tailor, however, was not impressed with what he described as Ludwig's dirty habits, and on the Monday morning he had told him that he could not stay at his house another night. Ludwig had then gone to a hotel in Finsbury, at which he was a regular guest, but he was also turned away from that establishment. Ludwig's response on being told that he could not stay was to throw down his razors in a passion, much to the alarm of the other residents. The landlord of that hotel was interviewed by a journalist from the Press Association later that week, and it was more than evident that Ludwig was anything but his favourite guest. According to the reporter's subsequent article, the landlord stated that since the last Whitechapel murder, he had been very suspicious of Ludwig. On the Sunday after the murder, he had called about nine o'clock in a very dirty condition, saying that he had been out all night and he began talking about the Spitalfields affair. He brought with him a case of razors and a large pair of scissors, and after a time he wanted to shave the landlord. The landlord went on to say that he was an extraordinary man, always in a bad temper, and frequently grinding his teeth when enraged. The landlord believed he had some knowledge of anatomy, having been a doctor's assistant in the German army. He always carried razors and scissors with him. The landlord knew that he associated with low women. The landlady of the hotel also weighed in against Ludwig and she told the journalist that on the day after the murder, Wetzel, as she referred to him, had called at their establishment early in the morning and had washed his hands saying he had been injured. Another person alleged that there was blood on his hands, but respecting this, the journalist conceded, the landlady cannot speak. The police, it appears, considered Ludwig a very likely suspect as the perpetrator of the Whitechapel murders, and he was interviewed in his cell by an interpreter, by inspectors Abiline and Helson, as well as by Detective Sergeant Thick. His next court appearance was on Tuesday the 25th of September when an embarrassed Constable Johnson was forced to admit that not only had he sent the prisoner on his way when he had found him with the woman in Three Kings Court, but he had also omitted to take a note of the woman's address. The police had transpired were still trying to find the woman, no doubt hoping that her testimony would help prove Ludwig's guilt as the Whitechapel murderer. To that end, Inspector Abiline requested that the prisoner be remanded again in order to give them time to locate the woman. Mr Saunders again concurred and Ludwig was once more remanded in custody. It is more than evident that at the end of September 1888, the police considered Charles Ludwig Wetzel a prime suspect in the murders, but subsequent events would render their suspicions unfounded. For on the 30th of September, with Ludwig locked up in police custody, the Whitechapel murderer struck again, killing Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, and the case for Ludwig being the perpetrator collapsed. On Tuesday the 2nd of October, he once more appeared in court, where Elizabeth Burns, having at last been located by the police, gave evidence against him. The police, however, told the court that Ludwig had satisfactorily accounted for his whereabouts on the nights of the recent murders, and the magistrate, Mr Saunders, taking into consideration that the prisoner had been in custody a fortnight, now allowed him to be discharged, and he walked free from the court. However, by mid-October, Charles Ludwig was up to his old tricks, as the Star newspaper, in its edition of Wednesday the 17th of October, reported that he had again been seen flourishing a knife and acting in a suspicious manner. The article added that 
The police are keeping him under surveillance at present as there are some doubts as to the state of his mind. While the man was previously in custody, a doctor declined to pronounce him insane. There is little doubt that Charles Ludwig was not Jack the Ripper. Yet his case illustrates a problem that confronted the police over and over again throughout their investigations into the murders. For he was just one of several men who were arrested on suspicion of being the Whitechapel murderer who, although exonerated of any involvement in the actual crimes, were nonetheless quite capable of having carried them out and who therefore posed a grave danger to any unfortunate woman who might encounter them in the dark corners of Whitechapel and Spitalfields. Little wonder that, as the autumn of terror drew on, the women of the district were reported to be arming themselves as protection against the risks posed by the assortment of misfits and ne'er-do-wells who were so much in abundance in the Victorian East End. <laughs>